for Paul uh, Shevich, and he is going to be presenting his um, Master of Architecture thesis, Temporality in Architecture, Facilitating Change in Toronto's Post-War Suburbs, I believe, yes, it's still the same title. Um, <clears throat> Um, Paul's uh, supervisor is Mark Rogalewski, second reader is Carlo Parante, and we're uh, happy to welcome two of our guest critics today, um, Sheila McCarthy and Paul Dosett. Sheila McCarthy is an associate professor in Ryerson School of Urban and Regional Planning. She is a licensed architect and urbanist whose expertise in design and development focuses on urbanization and housing with a strong community development focus. She believes that planning and architecture are, are byproducts of complex territorial networks and cultural history. Sheila is a graduate of the University of Waterloo and Harvard University, where she was a Fulbright scholar. In 2017, she founded Together Design Lab at Ryerson University, which takes a collaborative approach to investigating and creating innovative solution to housing issues and mar within marginalized communities in Canada. In addition, she's the director of the Plus City Lab, an innovative research and design practice exploring platforms that focus on contemporary interdisciplinary approaches to city and open territory design due to rapid growth and urbanization. Welcome, Sheila. And Paul Dewitt is uh, you said, sorry, is principal architect at Sustainable and, and an instructor at Ryerson's Department of Architectural Science. Paul is a leading thinker and advocate in the space of sustainability and architecture. For the past decade, Paul has been central to the introduction of sustainable architecture to the mainstream while practicing deep community engagement with equity seeking groups of all backgrounds and abilities. At the core of Paul's philosophy and practice is the belief that design and construction solutions should be simple, sensitive and sustainable, and they should take into account, they should take into account people, the planet and prosperity. Thank you um, all for joining us. Um, Paul Shevitz, you uh, know the routine by now, you have 20 minutes to, uh, to present your uh, thesis. Uh, following which we'll open the floor for any kind of questions that have to do with clarifying anything you've presented. And following that, uh, we will get into a uh, feedback scenario, uh, starting with our guest uh, critics. So Paul, if you're ready, please go ahead. Awesome, great. Welcome everybody. Um, so I want to start the uh, presentation with uh, my thesis statement. Uh, I'll just go ahead and read it. So exploring and understanding obsolescence as it applies to suburban development can help to plan better suburbs that are a more livable and functional part of Toronto. Residential zoning bylaws put in place by governments restricts the abilities for suburbs to adapt to the changing societal needs of individuals that inhabit the city of Toronto. Existing bylaws must be altered so that they facilitate change to occur in order for the suburbs to evolve into more useful and functional living spaces. My research questions are, what makes a suburb obsolete? What are the forces of change that are being stopped from occurring in Toronto suburbs? And what are the architectural opportunities for a new type of residential environment when these forces are applied to an existing residential suburb within Toronto? Um, so I want to start the discussion with, or the presentation with obsolescence. So obsolescence was first applied to architecture and the built environment in 1910 by Reginald Pelham Bolton and was directed towards commercial buildings losing value over time. He wrote about several factors that led to commercial obsolescence, such as the change of habit and shifting population centers, which would work in tandem to degrade the property's utility and value. The sudden and drastic devaluation of these buildings paved the way to widespread demolition and eventually constant rebuilding. As architecture evolved into the 20th century, this notion of demolition and rebuilding had become a norm in North American construction practices. Even into the 21st century, this notion of short-lived buildings still exists. But it, was an, it, but it was during the 1920s and 30s that the concept began to be applied to neighborhoods and eventually entire cities themselves, such as Toronto. The obsolete suburb of the early 20th century became synonymous with blight and denoted areas with substandard housing, less than adequate health quality, and poor economic performance. 
Co-director of Princeton Melt Mellon Initiative in Architecture, Allison Eisenberg explains that it was the concept of obsolescence that redevelopers wielded as a weapon to remake downtowns, which further solidified the notion of demolition and rebuilding. Further, or following the economic following the economic and housing boom after World War II, entire neighborhoods were deemed obsolete and torn down to make way for new housing across North America. While the obsolete suburb of the early 20th century was built with little to no regulation that resulted in poor satellite suburbs disconnected from City of Toronto suburbs uh, services, um, contemporary suburbs are instead defined by rules that are ultimately obsolete. According to the City of Toronto demographics, substandard housing still exists and accounts for approximately 60% of all housing as inadequate, unsuitable, and unaffordable housing, with unaffordability being a critical problem with, uh, in the city and its suburbs. Less than adequate health is not only tied to individual households, but also to entire communities, where the health of a community is seen as lacking in many suburbs in the greater Toronto area. Poor economic performance can be attributed to a variety of factors when it comes to suburban design, but sustainable design and impl implementation of sustainable technologies has been linked to strengthening economic performance through comfortable and efficient suburban design. Architectural obsolescence is prevalent amongst the majority of dwellings within suburbs, as the majority of suburbs are only allowed one housing typology within them. The City of Toronto consists of six residential zoning typologies found within Bylaw 569-2013. Each of these zones permit different types of housing to be built. The RD zone provides for detached housing, the RS zone adds semi-detached housing, RT zone adds townhouses, RM zone takes away townhouses, but adds duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and low-rise apartments. And the R zone permits all of the aforementioned, with RA zones only providing apartment buildings. While Toronto's, zoning, while, while Toronto's residential zones are separated into six categories, only two of those zones, RM and R zones, permit housing typologies that fall between low-density detached homes and high-density high-rise housing. The figures here show the distribution of, home, of zones among the city and the percentage of Toronto's yellow belt that consists of RD zones in comparison to other low-rise housing options. This is a problem because while the majority of housing is low density, higher density typologies such as those found in our zone, our zones grow in affluence uh, due to their exclusivity, exacerbating social issues such as unaffordability. Toronto's residential zoning bylaw ineffectively addresses the contemporary driving forces by restricting change and evolution within the city suburbs. The City of Toronto has action plans such as Transform TO and Housing TO that outline key issues in the city as well as goals going into the future. Within these plans, I have identified three forces of change that are a goal to be addressed by the city, but are currently not due to the aforementioned bylaw. The three forces are climate change, unaffordability, and community building. Transform TO is the city's latest action plan that seeks to address climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emission levels found in 1990, a total of 80% by the year 2050. A key component of this action plan saw community involvement in order to determine important aspects of the city to improve its carbon footprint. This involvement had to develop a series of short-term strategies, including supporting energy efficiency in buildings and advancing sustainable transportation. A 2014 National Geographic report found that over 50% over of a city's carbon emissions are linked to its metropolitan suburbs, with, with primary drivers being household income, vehicle ownership, and house size, all of which are, are larger in the suburbs. Updating the bylaw to allow for more typologies would allow TransformTO to extend, extend and include the city's suburbs, which would, which would more effectively address the issue of climate change. Another action plan set out by Toronto is Housing TO, which is a 10-year plan spanning between 2020 and 2030 and sets, to, sets out to address the issue of, of unaffordable housing in the city. Nearly half of all renters in Toronto's housing market spend over 30% of their income on rent. According to the CMHC, housing is considered affordable when an individual spends less than 30% of their before-tax income on rent. This definition shows that nearly half of the city's renting population is living in unaffordable housing. To make matters worse, a 2018 City of Toronto report indicates that rent prices in purpose-built purpose units have reached a 15-year high, while vacancy rates have reached a 16-year low. As a result, waiting lists for, for more affordable housing 
uh, reach thousands of residents who are forced out of their living situations. For an average Toronto household, it takes 109 months in order to afford a down payment for a typical home in the city, or nearly nine years. While people are trying to get into the market, half of Toronto houses are filled with tenants as opposed to owners. The other half are filled with empty nesters, couples whose children have moved out, leaving the home they left with unoccupied bedrooms. Collectively, empty nesters contribute a great deal to, to, to Toronto's 2.2 million empty bedrooms due to the inability of downsizing living situations in the bylaw and people's desire to remain in their community. Vibrant communities were always found within suburban neighborhoods in the mid to late 20th century, making for an ideal living situation paired with the Canadian dream. One factor that led to these vibrant communities was the sheer density of families within a neighborhood, which invoked interactions between neighbors in and out of the suburb. Quint Studer, author of Building a Vibrant Community, explains that vibrant communities are achieved at the intersection of several different forces, with management of change and civic engagement being of critical importance. As family sizes decrease and density in these same suburbs declines, the vibrancy one could find in the older neighborhoods begins to fade. People now have more space to live with less people, creating large gaps within a neighborhood that indirectly hinder community building. This new notion paired with the spacious organization of homes, once brimming with people in a way prohibits any, source, any sense of community building by separating people behind large lawns and wide empty residential streets. With the aforementioned issues being heavily prevalent within uh, Toronto's post-war suburbs, they are the ideal locations for responding to the driving forces of change. The existing housing stock of fully detached homes offer the opportunity to implement missing middle housing typologies and densifying their respective neighborhoods. As well, the organization of these suburbs and the ex excessive space dedicated to roadways and lawns offers potential to further, for further land intensification. In order to determine a site to use for the proposal, a series of criteria have been adapted from the Home Zone Design Guide by Mike Bidolf, an urban planner at Cardiff Council, in which he outlines existing neighborhoods that are most suitable for the implementation of a home zone. The guidebook introduces the home zone concept, which is a residential street that prioritizes living spaces over any provision for traffic and elaborates on its uses and benefits in residential design, as well as providing starting points for designing a home zone. In the book, Bidolf outlines that the implementation of home zones may work best specifying specifying a list of criteria for the most suitable types of residential streets. Some of the criteria have been expanded on while I have added others in order to better fit Toronto's post-war suburbs. A portion of Humber Heights in Westmount in Etobicoke fits the selection criteria. The site is Riverly Drive located just north of Lawrence Avenue and is within walking distance of existing bus stops and routes, as well as the, as well as the proposed developments for Transit City. Less than one kilometer away, there is a connection to the Humber River Recreational Trail as well as the Riverly Greenhouse. However, Riverly Drive does not have sidewalks urging residents to drive over instead of walk. The entire strip is less than 200 meters long and as a residential street sees very little traffic. Roughly one third of each property is dedicated to front yard and driveway space with none of the properties using the lawn as a productive green space. With a median household income of $68,996, the neighborhood has not yet established significant affluence like the Bridal Path or Rosedale. Finally, the neighborhood is largely populated with fully detached houses as the residential areas within the, neighbor within the neighborhood are prim primarily zoned as RD. Furthermore, the Riverly Greenhouse right by the neighborhood currently has no vacancy and a very long queue for entry, as indicated by a greenhouse admin. Many of the neighboring suburbs are unable to utilize the amenities despite there being a large demand from residents. The, the demand for affordable housing also exists as the house monotyping on the street denies families and individuals who cannot afford a fully detached home. Paired with the necessity of car ownership, the expenses of living in a suburb are often too high for particular demographics who are forced to look for smaller and more affordable living situations or out of the city. In order to understand the density of the neighborhood, it would be suitable to look at the ratio of people to the number of bedrooms within a given area. Determining the amount of empty bedrooms located on the chosen site can begin to show the inefficiency of contemporary suburban design and organization. The chosen site contains 26 fully detached homes along the street. Using, using the City of Toronto demographics, one can deduce that the ratio of people to bedrooms is 0.59 indicating that nearly half of all bedrooms along the street lay empty. 
By comparison, a similarly sized street in Cabbage Town has a ratio of 0 0.67. The difference being a tighter streetscape as well as mixing typologies on the street itself, which is able to be achieved because of, the, because of a different set of zoning bylaws. Cabbage Town also has a higher average of single family households with housing options that are more suitable for that particular demographic. When comparing the ratio of built space versus open space, it is possible to see a disconnect not only between the solid and void, but also among the solid. When the ratio is as low as it is in this suburb, there is much discontinuity among buildings pronouncing the, pronouncing the disconnected and fragmented nature of the suburb. In between these masses are undefined voids. In this case, a typical wide residential street with copious amounts of parking and little spatial definition. While these conditions of auto-oriented strip developments are plentiful in many cities, they create an unfriendly environment for pedestrians and ultimately fail at responding to the forces of change. Deconstructing the site into zones allows one to analyze not only the way the block is organized, but also to understand the mechanics of how the block operates. The centrality of the road makes it a highly dominant feature of the site, and it's easily and its width easily accommodates a two-way passage as well as street parking, which reinforces the nature, the notion of a car-dependent neighborhood. Beyond this, driveways are on average half the width of the road, easily allowing two cars to fit, as well as tether the home to the road, further reinforcing this notion. Each front lawn acts as a buffer space between the home and the road, and despite there being ample room for the lawn to be utilized as a productive space, this is hardly ever achieved. In contrast, the the backyards are further segmented by fences and hedges and vary greatly in terms of completion. The lack of pedestrian infrastructure creates an imbalance between the car and the human, making the road unsafe and restricting the usability of the neighborhood. As a result, the, the only zones in the neighborhood that are pedestrian friendly are the homes and backyards, both of which are largely private spaces, hindering social interaction. Augmenting the zoning bylaws for the neighborhood will allow the introduction of new housing typologies that would be better suited for different demographics. Existing fully detached homes could potentially be converted into duplex or even triplex homes, further densifying the site and responding to the demand for more affordable housing. The current nine meter wide road can be replaced with a narrower one way road that rebalances the site between the pedestrian and the automobile by providing spaces for social interaction. The 7,020 square meter uh, area consisting of the existing road, front lawns, and driveways has the potential to double the amount of dwelling units on the site by introduce, introducing a new block of properties onto the site. With roughly 6,240 square meters dedicated to the rear yard, there is ample space to, to intensify this area of the site to provide even more housing options, more productive green spaces, and a pedestrian environment that connects to the site's context. The big move of the proposal sees the addition of a new block onto the site that responds to the forces of change through increased density in the, in the form of new housing typologies and community amenities, as well as implementing sustainable technologies and design. In order to achieve this, the existing property line is questioned and redrawn in order to bring the building to the edge of the property without demolition. The remaining portion of the property is purchased by a developer and is sectioned off and moved to the center of the site, creating 26 new properties. By allowing additional building typologies in the neighborhood, the housing stock can be diversified from the existing situation and over time, new buildings will be added to the, onto the block. At the same time, existing buildings will undergo changes that could see the addition of new typologies as well as changes to existing spaces, such as garages into secondary suites. To contrast the existing larger fully detached homes along the street, the new block will consist of smaller residential units more suitable for smaller family types. These units are organized to have an infill unit in located in between them as seen in the figures on the screen. The roof of the infill units acts as a walkout terrace for the residential units and provides a great deal of light through the terrace facade, being the, main, the unit's main source of natural light. In order to allow the light to enter the portion underneath the terrace, a portion of the ground is, is raised 1.5 meters, creating a tiered ground floor connected to the outdoors. The prefabricated nature of these buildings will make their construction simpler while also affording the, the ability to deconstruct facade panels. This helps the infill buildings facilitate change and adapt to the changing needs of the community by supporting a variety of uses. As well, these spaces could provide employment opportunities within the neighborhood that are within walking distance, eliminating the need for occasional car use. This is especially useful 
uh, for an aging demographic, such as the one found in this neighborhood that may not even need a car at all. The new one-way streets would be utilized as winners. Originally a Dutch term, a winner translates to mean a residential yard or a living yard and seeks to, to integrate vehicle traffic, pedestrians, cyclists, and children at play. The main design features the elimination of the traditional separation of the car zone and the human zone and having a single plane in which all users move on. By blurring the lines separating pedestrian and automobile, more space is afforded to the pedestrian, which in turn allows for more space to walk, bike, and socialize. Currently on the street, there are many driveways and garages that lay empty, suggesting that in this new environment, the garage would be transformed into another space, such as an at-home workshop. Eventually, as many residents in the community begin to rely less on the automobile, garages will begin to change their identities being tied to the car and adopt uses set out by the homeowner. The implementation of the One Earth is a transition towards a community that is less auto-dependent. Street furniture, such as benches and planters, work not only as traffic controlling features, but also to reestablish balance between the car and the pedestrian. Luckily, many of the existing trees are located in, in such a way that would work with the One Earth layout in place of street furniture. While some trees would need to be removed, the net amount of trees on the site would increase in order to line the new One Earths with greenery. In an effort to further densify the site, the, pro the proposal includes reorganizing the backyards to incorporate a pedestrian only lane to increase the amount of walking space. This new lane could work in tandem with other blocks uh, to create a network of walkways that eventually connects the site to existing green infrastructure such as the ravines and existing community amenities such as the greenhouse. Existing homes could be reoriented in order to provide a connection between the one earth and this new lane increasing the breadth of a potential pedestrian network. The addition of the lane provides the opportunity to, to build laneway housing onto the site in order to further densify the, the community and increase the avail available housing stock. The RD zone guidelines would need to be altered in such a way to allow the addition of this lane along with the laneway housing, which is already possible in some R zones. The resulting environment will introduce housing options onto a pedestrian centered lane that supports more sustainable and efficient methods of travel as opposed to auto dependence. As the lane is free from car travel, the garden spaces offer the garden spaces offer the potential to be utilized as productive green spaces for existing homes. Adding these gardens will not will work to enhance to will work to enhance the area aesthetically by providing a lush area, a, a lush and healthy walking environment, further promoting a healthier lifestyle. Shifting the community towards less car dependence is made possible through easy access to transit by expanding pedestrian networks and connecting the site to existing transit stops and, and pedestrian networks. The new laneway could be continued onto surrounding blocks and spread outwards to connect the existing pedestrian networks and to enter the nearby greenhouse and park. Currently, the park only has a swing set, but this could be improved by, improving, by providing amenities such as a covered picnic area tennis courts and a fully equipped play park. A connection to the Humber River Recreational Trail could also be made across the ravine with a new bridge. And I end on the new density metrics um, from this proposal. The inclusion of the block would bring 26 new homes onto the site, each of, the, each of which has two bedrooms resulting in an additional 52 bedrooms onto the site, putting the total number at 130. Since these new homes are most suitable for, for, for individuals or couples, this new block could potentially introduce 52 more, in, more individuals onto the site. Using the figures from before and combining the new numbers from the additional block, the ratio of people to bedrooms changes from 0 0.59 to 0 0.81. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, we have now uh, some time for questions regarding clarification. Um, I'll ask our guests to uh, to come forth. Uh, Sheila, do you have any questions for Paul uh, of a clarification kind of nature? I guess I, I guess one question I had, Paul, is how much did you investigate into sort of the tenure of land and the urban situation of these properties um, before or during the process of your investigation? Well, when you mean the, the tenure, are you talking about um, like the, the ownership? I guess I mean the property line locations, how much of it is right of way, how much is where the utilities are located. 
those types of things, I guess I'm assuming that they're the actual tenure of the main parts of the land is um, single family or private ownership. But I guess right. I was wondering the street, you sort of, it appears as if you have the line drawn right at the edge of the road, whereas most mm -hmm. of the time the right of way is wider than that. And so yeah. I, I just, I wanted to clarify how much of, how much of an investigation you had done into sort of the legal um, lines on the land. Because I know like my front yard, it's pretty much owned by the city, even though everyone thinks it's mine and I take care of it. Yeah, um, uh, if you're, right. So when I was looking at the, um, the zoning bylaw map and the uh, associated property lines on that map, um, it, it drew the line right at the edge of the road, which to me, communicated that because um, I have a similar situation where the boulevard is owned by the city in front of my house and um, I guess a portion of the front uh, of the front lawn is also owned but I didn't as far as I could tell the entire property I'm not sure how much of the of the property is owned by the city because as far as I can tell services and utilities are underneath the road on the edges um, so as far as I can tell the property line goes right up to the to the edge of the road. Great, thanks. I just wanted that clarified. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Paul, did you have any questions for Paul? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Yuri. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Paul. Thank um, you. I'll just ask one question that's sort of clarification, but it's going to lead in. It's going to lead into the later discussion. Um, I, I understand that the premise of your thesis in order to add more uh, housing options, we need to change the zoning bylaws. Yep. Um, and just wondering um, if you considered and what you think will be the, the primary obstacle to that change. I guess the primary obstacle to that would likely be um, approval from council, which I don't have too much knowledge about legal processes and things like that, but the whole approval of changing and creating a new set of bylaws to allow for this, uh, for this uh, intensification, I assume would be very difficult to, to, to organize and, and pass through, um, as well as pro probably a lot of pushback and, and fighting from community members, because change isn't something that humans like very much. Yeah, in, in, in my opinion, you got it in the second one. Council will do what the existing property owners want. Okay. Um, the likelihood of getting the existing property owners to uh, go for this idea, there's your yeah. primary obstacle. I don't, yeah. I don't suggest you don't keep tilting at that windmill, but uh, there's, a, there's the primary obstacle. So thank you. Right. Uh, just just a, a point to break off from that is uh, I when I was looking for a neighborhood I at first I was looking at York Mills and when doing research about suburbs in, in Toronto uh, York Mills and and other other affluent neighborhoods such as Rosedale are among the most I guess like against change they have the most pushback um, and so I tried to go for um, a neighborhood that hasn't developed as much affluence Okay. Um, Mark or Carlo, did you have any particular questions for uh, Paul? I don't have any questions of clarification, no. Yeah, okay. uh, um, me either. All right, then I, I would ask our, uh, our guests and maybe Sheila, if you would like to start to um, you know, give Paul some feedback and, um, and conversation about his uh, presentation. Great, thanks so much, Paul. I also thank jumped you. into the I jumped into the clarifying questions rather than saying thank you for your presentation. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Evident that you've done a lot of hard work <laughs> in this. I always have these burning questions that I want clarified right at the beginning. So That's I guess um, I guess probably similar to Paul, my question does begin to sort of begin with the lead in, and I was beginning to think about if you know where the sources of the land were leading and thinking about the primary obstacles. Is that my assumption from doing different urban and urbanism? And urban developments that it will be the pro it'll be the property owners and so yeah. I also sort of think back to the 1960s when you know 
in the United States and through Canada when there was expropriation that happened for the public good uh, that occurred and you know happened sort of broadly across many different cities, put a lot of communities or your uh, vulnerable communities at disadvantage. And so I think it's interesting the community that you've selected here isn't necessarily primarily from that group, but I was wondering if you could comment on you sort of just breezed over that ex expropriation piece. And to me, that is like the real nut here that's going to be um, extremely difficult to do. What if people don't want to do it? And in order to expropriate, how are you going to convince them that this is a public good that's worthwhile, especially considering that you're transferring the land to a private developer who will profit from the project? Right. So um, the way that I saw that, this could possibly convince people to want this in their in their community is um, the fact that it's currently unable to you're you're currently unable to downsize um, your living situation. So um, I guess I guess this will be a, a jumble of ideas all in one as a response. But the fact that you're unable to downsize um, hinders the ability to. Um, or rather, I guess I'll, I should start off by saying that the portion of the land that gets sectioned off um, and is it, used to create a new block um, is directly across the new one earth um, from the existing homes. And that allows the people uh, living in, let's just say house A, um, the opportunity to stay in that neighborhood, maybe in the process of this development um, through legal transactions or situations or whatever it is, um, the priority could be given to the existing property owner if they would like to purchase the, the lot that's directly across to the, from them. That's a, it's an idea that I thought in case that if the idea of downsizing to them has crossed their mind, but they're unable to do so, this, this new development gives them that opportunity, but also allows them to stay in the community. And the inclusion of this, of this, um, of this proposal and this development adds a lot of spaces that eliminate um, like, like car use, right? It's, it's, it's shifting the neighborhood towards less auto dependence, which I think is an attractive feature to a lot of people. And I know this is a little bit informal, I suppose, but upon visiting the site several times, I managed to run into a, a, a resident or two and I asked them if they, are frustrated with the lack of amenity spaces. Um, and the biggest thing that they said that they were frustrated with was the fact that there's no sidewalk on the street. Um, and so upon doing research, uh, I found this concept of a one earth that not only adds that space um, to a residential block, but also creates these other opportunities um, such as like community amenities and at the same time, housing options and, and things like that. So I think it's, I think it's all dependent. Like it's, it's a very subjective thing, person to person. I, it's maybe not the most useful to say. It depends on the people there. But I do think that adding all these immunity, uh, community spaces and all these amenities is an attractive thing, um, especially because um, newer developments. Uh, I had a image in in one of my slides, um, West Five is a development in London, Ontario, that's currently being developed and is focused on community amenities and community interaction through a central park that prioritizes social interaction. And that I feel in a way could be achieved by adding this new block, which also densifies the area. Thanks very much. I just think that it's, when we're thinking about these issues of urbanism and urban design, and many times frustratingly, a lot of the holdups or difficulties of moving forward with a lot of projects has to do with a lot of the dynamics of the property ownership that's underneath of them or utility corridors or those different pieces. So yeah. the way you're describing it is it's quite utopian. It's like, well, everyone's yeah. going to give up their front lawn and you know, all these people are going to work together and they're going to want to completely change the nature of the home and, and the neighborhood from what they purchased into something else that is going to be right. completely different. Um, not necessarily knowing exactly, and I mean, 
I feel like the wet blanket here, like what the property values are going to be and what will sort of incentivize them to do that. And so I think sort of digging mm -hmm. deeper into kind of into some of those dynamics could actually help you begin to think about what are the steps required to do this project and how could you begin to use the notion of taking over some of these properties and densifying, but use it as a way to force you to be more creative. Right. I'm not saying that the central area isn't creative, but I guess I'm just a believer that so like the more you balance up against different rules and right, yeah. things that are difficult to change, yeah, yeah, it's going to force you to sort of dig deep in your creative toolbox to figure out how might I be able to do this. And I guess this is also probably tied to you know when they were reading my introduction. Yes, I'm an architect, but I also went to urban design school and then planning school because I realized that all of these dynamics underneath of the ground that are set up through legal mechanisms are actually the things that so much control our city. So yeah. it's really not so much about the zoning. I actually think that the zoning is going to be a piece of cake compared to changing the property ownership and convincing those homeowners to move, like to move in the direction that you want them to. And I, I would have liked to hear something about, well, like what the first mover is like, like what's the first lot? How is it different? What would the process be in actually having this happen? Okay. Um, because that's sort of like the rubber hits the road kind of stuff. And that's the things that I know that I deal with kind of every mm -hmm. day. It's those types of movements that I need to see or be able to affect change with. Otherwise, very few things can happen. And so I would just say, like, as you proceed in your career, to think mm -hmm. about those dynamics that are happening within the property ownership and the land ownership and how you might be able to convince those first people. Or maybe the project becomes slightly different as it moves along the block. Right. I don't know. What do you think, Paul? I'm sorry. I was thinking, Paul Jess, I can, I can tell he probably wants to add into this conversation <laughs> as well as others. Oh yeah. Um, I presume you're talking about me there, Sheila. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Um, yeah. Just to, just to build on what Sheila said before I, before I dive into my architecty questions. Um, I, th I think Paul, that the examples that you, that you pulled um, were a little bit misleading for you. Um, because West Five in London is great, but it's a new development. So you're not trying to take anything away from anybody. You're not going to yeah. change the ex existing circumstance in a way that might be perceived as negative. Similarly, right. by looking at examples in the UK and in the Netherlands, um, most properties there aren't individually owned. They're sort of state owned and people are in a state of renting. So when it comes to things like overcladding a whole, uh, you know, terrace block of houses or things like that, um, or, you know, doing moves like you're proposing here, the government can do it because they own all the land, they own all the properties, and they okay. just tell their tenants that this is going to happen, and then things happen. So uh, as Sheila said, you know, really drilling down, and, and when you're looking for examples, find examples that speak to how did you know, change across 26 privately owned properties happen ever, you know? And if you can't find an example of it, that probably is gonna tell something. But, okay, so I noticed that, uh, that my, my feeling was that you spent a lot of time in your thesis thinking as a planner, which is a good thing. Um, and you didn't spend so much time working as an architect, so, I'd like to sort of focus on the on the architecture you've proposed for a while. Um, it's uh, it's a little bit scant um, from a sustainability point of view. I really liked the panelization of the new homes um, in the center median, the way they were made of a kit of parts. All the pieces look like they all fit together as as pieces of a puzzle. They're all they're all kind of uniform um, in their in their styling. Um, there was also some talk about some laneway houses. There wasn't really any, uh, you know, much architectural discussion with them. They seemed to be just more of the same of the, of the pieces making up the, the new houses down the central strip. Mm -hmm. I very much like that you had active roofscapes. That was, that was helping. They, there were solar panels on the higher roofs and terraces on the lower, lower roofs. So that's making more use of space that's there, which is good. Um, so I'd just like to hear from you as an architect, because you've not, you've not shown it to us, but speak to us for a few minutes about, you know, 
how the aesthetic materiality of these new buildings contributes to the to the desirable character of the of the street. Um, just like to hear some discussion on that. Right. Um, so since I I went with a prefabricated approach to the the buildings, um, I thought or I it. I guess it, did, it wouldn't really make much sense to use brick or some kind of masonry as, you know, it, it'd just be kind of senseless for a prefabricated approach. Um, so in terms of the materiality, I tried to think a little bit more sustainably and I opted to use uh, a wood siding, um, specifically cedar shakes. Um, and the reason for that is not only because I quite like how it looks and it's, a, it's an attractive, uh, uh, exterior material, but also because it has a lot of natural resistances and insulation qualities that I think would help with um, the sustainable aspects of the actual uh, the buildings, um, as well as having the buildings organized into these blocks um, where they are connected as opposed to separated like fully detached homes. Um, I, I, I suppose, or I, I it would have a more uh, it would have an additional insulating factor because you don't have all these ex you don't have as much exterior exposure um so i tried to keep it all rather dense and um uh, the the wonder of concert concept is from uh, the netherlands and so a lot of uh european residential design i guess kind of came through with uh, as well with having a um you know a very small washroom on the ground floor um, and then the, the, t the tiered, uh, ground floor and the, the kind of zigzagged, uh, stepped, uh, leveling of the, of the unit. Um, the intent of that was to have the, uh, light kind of flow in and out of spaces within the building, um, in order to have more light, to promote a healthier, uh, living space and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and to utilize natural, like uh, natural light. Um, and, and then also talking about the uh, prefabricated aspect um, with the, uh, the, the only thing, this might be a bit of an aside, but what the only thing that I did re, uh, find out about the services, the existing utilities on the site is that a lot of them are, are located underneath the road. Um, and in order to try and bypass them, the foundation of the, of the um, of the of the buildings is using piles, so that a deeper excavation wouldn't have to be utilized. So that you don't have to you don't have to dig up all that ground and possibly expose uh, utilities. Um, and then it would also help with quick assembly and and uh, and not be as intrusive into the neighborhood. Okay. Sorry, Paul. Are you suggesting that the public utilities would remain underneath the private buildings after they're constructed? Sorry? Are you, you suggesting kind of cut that, out there. Sorry, are you suggesting then that the public utilities would remain under the private buildings uh, after they're constructed? Or would I just assumed you were proposing moving them? Um, well, I didn't want the project to be too intrus intrusive. So uh, with a lot, oh, I, I I do see that a lot of the utilities would, pro would probably remain underneath, um, but I'm not entirely sure, or rather, sorry, <laughs> let me just catch my tongue here. I'm not entirely sure if the utilities are located underneath, but if they were, I wanted it to be as little, in, as little of an intrusive process as possible. And um, if they were, um, then they would be moved. But um, the pile foundations would help with um, with a, a quicker installation of the buildings um, and not making it as intrusive. But if the utilities were located underneath the buildings, I did picture them being moved onto the site where the new one earth would be located so that they're not, they don't have anything above them so that they're accessible. I just wanted to ask you a question. You said a couple of times of not making the buildings too intrusive. Is that one of the goals of the project? Um, I uh, maybe uh, maybe not necessarily a goal, but uh, it was a it was a reason to choose prefabricated um, uh, a, a prefabricated approach as opposed to a, tr a more traditional approach. 
Um, you're right. I did say it a couple of times. It is a goal, or it, but it's not necessarily a main goal. I was just wondering, because to me, this is quite an intrusive project. It's, <laughs> right. it's not, it's not subtle. Um, right. And so it, I just wanted to sort of ask you to clarify your kind of thought processes around those different things, because again, sometimes, you know, not being intrusive in terms of the mechanisms of timing of construction would allow it to proceed well, uh, faster and could be great, could be better in terms of prefab, but I just wanted you to know, like, I, I was concerned that you had a notion that this project wasn't a major change and wasn't, it is a ma to me, it is a major change. And yeah. so I think when you're balancing your goals and selecting different methods, it's sort of need to, I think that from your expression of your face now, I think that you're quite honest about what it is you're proposing. Uh, I just was questioning, I guess, some of the orders of the things or some of the assumptions you've made. Right. Okay, time is um, moving along. Um, Paul, did you have any other comments to provide? Uh, no, uh, just if there's any, any last questions for clarification or, uh, or anything else that anybody would like to say. Hey, um, Carlo, Mark, I know we're all familiar with, with the project. You, you obviously more so than anyone else here, but uh, is uh, if not, then we'll, we'll just move along and I'll ask Marco if he has any comments. Uh, no, I don't have anything to add. It's been, it's been discussed quite thoroughly. I think most of the, the, the key issues were, have been pretty um, solidly addressed. I think uh, to Sheila's point, Paul, this is a, this is a major change. Um, yeah. So I think, I think maybe when you, when you're talking about intrusive, you're, you're thinking comparatively to, you know, not building a 40 story tower at the end of the block, but this is still a very big change. Right, I, so I, I guess I kind of want to clarify, uh, I, I'll, I'll apologize for using the word intrusive and making it seem like I'm not thinking that this is a big change. I'm aware that it's a radical change to the site. Um, I think the, the, uh, the word intrusive was wrong to use, I think, uh, I think what I was trying to get at was more of a uh, a time kind of a uh, time standpoint where it wouldn't it would take less time to construct something using a prefabricated approach as opposed to um, a more traditional approach. So I, I apologize for using the the word in, intrusive. I suppose maybe if I could just help pull out. Uh, I think in terms of the discussions we had about this. Uh, part of the intrusive discussion was how could this happen quickly so that it doesn't become a building site for five years. Right. Uh, from that point of view, that's intrusive. And the other aspect that we discussed was uh, the quality of the, or the characteristics of the architecture, the aesthetics of the architecture, the materiality, what sort of materiality and what sort of architectural um, response is appropriate that may be more um, acceptable to the existing community. Right, and my my interpretation of that statement was had more to do with issues of scale. Um, you know, the fact that it is, uh, in terms of its its height, um, you know, in fact, you know, modest compared to the existing houses, um, but the but the density is very significant, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks for jumping in, Mark. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, Paul, thank you for the uh, presentation and thank you to our guests uh, for their commentary and participation. Uh, Paul, I'm going to ask you to uh, leave the meeting, please. You've gone yeah. through the report, of course, yeah. and um, at some point after our deliberations, um, either today or, or sometime in the very near future, Mark will get a hold of you and provide you with, uh, with feedback from, from the deliberations. Okay. okay. So again, awesome. thank you.